I really appreciated the first prayer this morning. It brought home to me my entire lesson preparation process. When I left here last Sunday, and I was driving home, I'd already read the verses I was going to be using. And I had my entire outline done up Sunday evening. And I was doing pretty good until Monday morning. Because by Monday morning, I had five sermons in my head, and I knew only one of them could be preached this Sunday. And it wasn't because any one of them was wrong, it's just they're not going to be too happy if I go way beyond 20-something minutes. And the more I thought about it, the worse it got. I kept having all five sermons cruise through my head, and Tuesday, I knew I've got to send in a title, and I've got to send in the passage. The passage was easy. The title was killing me. And so this was about the seventh title I came up with. And it missed the mark. Sometimes that's how the world treats us. Lots of different things crashing in on us to the point we don't know which ends up. And even when talking about scripture, sometimes it's really easy to get distracted from what's important. This title reflects that. The first part of the passage that was read today, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. I kept going over and going over and going over all my sermons, trying to focus in on the right one. By about Thursday night, Friday, I was good. I had finally managed to latch on to the one that I knew from the beginning was the one I was supposed to be working with. It was what naturally followed on from last week's sermon. But as I went through it, it all fell flat at the beginning. And I'm like, why in the world am I not getting any traction right off the bat? It's because I was missing out on what the majority tends to miss out on in this passage. We're able to see John, John the Baptist. We got a good grasp on who he was. We know that he was sent by God as a witness. That word there is used in legal term, meaning you're giving testimony. It's something you've seen, not something you believe and think that you've never witnessed before. So when John is giving witness, he's not talking about something he has no understanding of. He's talking about something he has a firm grounding in. That part, no problem. It's the part that comes after it that was where I realized I had flat tires and was going nowhere. To bear witness of the light. And I got to thinking, all right, I know that the previous verses talked about the light. And the rest of this is talking about the light. What is the light? Oh, it's Jesus. Right. What's the light? Long pause. So I did what anybody would do. I went and grabbed as many commentaries as possible, and I start reading through them. Some of them come right out and say, oh, the light is light. This stuff that we've got shining down from all these bulbs. And they actually try to show that Jesus is the light, like a physical light, that shows us something. That sort of sounds like the law all over again. Why would God say, in the beginning was the word, the law, and then turn around and say, oh, give witness to the law, but I'm going to call it light this time. That one didn't work out, and there were only two commentaries that addressed it that way, 
and they really didn't give good scriptural basis for it. It took me a little bit, and I had to think about my own sermon to realize God does give the answer in scripture, and it was right there in my sermon. I wasn't making the connection. So what this should have been titled, and I'm going to go ahead and give you the end of my sermon at the beginning, Threat versus Warning with a foundation of love. I said this last week, and I think I even said it in the sermon before that. God is love. When we look at it through that lens, one of these answers falls out real fast. Love doesn't threaten, but love does warn. When we look at that passage, giving witness to God's love. That one, yeah. John can do that. Now, let's go ahead and move backwards, which is forwards in this case, to Malachi. The last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. John's job was assigned 400 years before John's even born. Malachi, the book, the name, means my messenger or the Lord's messenger. So, in the book by the Lord's messenger, we're told, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me, before the Lord. The same thing that we read in John chapter 1. John is going before and preparing the way for the Lord. We also get another description here the messenger of the covenant. We have the witness who's preparing the way for the messenger of the covenant. The covenant he's talking about is the covenant that God made with Abraham. The short of it is, you follow my commands, you and all your descendants, and I will be your God. That covenant was being fulfilled but not fully accomplished. <coughs> Partially because that covenant involved a very significant style of sacrifice. When God makes that covenant with Abraham, Abraham gets all the sacrificial animals, <coughs> cuts them in half, keeps all the birds of prey away all day long until night comes, and when God establishes that covenant with Abraham, the pot of fire goes between the halves of the animals. That style of covenant was one of the more significant ones. Essentially, when you did that kind of agreement, both sides would walk between the halves of the sacrifice. And what you were essentially saying is, if either of us fails in our part, may this or worse be done unto us. <laughs> Except Abraham didn't go through between the sacrificed animals. God took up both halves of that covenant. He went through for himself. He went through for Abraham. This is part of the mystery that they didn't understand. So when the messenger of the covenant is coming, they're expecting to get an answer. I guess you could treat it as light illumination. They're expecting to get an understanding of what was originally meant. Malachi 4, 4 through 6 are the last verses of the Old Testament. It says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, 
which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Elijah, a great prophet, a prophet who came at a time when God was redeeming his people. The prophet the messenger, who in this case is going before the Lord. It starts out by telling them, remember the law of Moses, the statutes, the judgments, the law. Remember it. Keep it. It's important. It's from God. It gives you guidance. It gives you direction. But then think about the last part of what this verse is saying. Was it a threat or a warning? Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers or I will come and strike the land with a curse. Backing up a bit, the messenger. The messenger was to prepare the way That word prepare had its root in the word turn, meaning turn aside any enemies that happened to be in the way of the oncoming king. The messenger that prepared the way at that time was the one who went usually before a king or some high official. This messenger had a lot of responsibility. If there was any kind of obstruction in the road, whether a tree blocking the road or something like that, his job was to make sure it all got cleared out. If there was an enemy in that territory, he was supposed to be scouting it out and find out, was there a threat? Do I need to do something to turn aside this enemy? That's the reason why this word's root is turn. Think about how John responds initially. We have John the Baptist teaching, Matthew 3, 2, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare to turn, repent, to turn from sin towards God. Think about the last part of Malachi. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. That's not a threat. Given what comes next, it's a strong warning. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. This is one of two times when the curse was already embedded and we didn't necessarily get that point. In the beginning in Genesis, when man sins, And God announces the curse. Part of that curse was already there. Just like it's already here. Think about this curse. Your desire shall be for your husband. Nasty curse if your desire isn't for your husband. When God talks to them about the consequences of their sin, in terms of a curse, a lot of what he said wasn't a curse if you were doing things God's way to begin with. Your desire shall be for your husband? Yes, it should be. Well, that no good, low account, etc. You know what he did last week? He forgot our anniversary. It's only been 30 years and he's forgotten it all 30. It's a curse not because God's changing it, but because there's something that should already be naturally there if things are going right. If things are going right, the hearts of the fathers should be towards the children. And the hearts of the children 
should be towards the fathers. This is part of John's job. Not just remembering the statutes and the judgments, but most importantly, fixing a serious problem. There's the law, the do's and the don'ts, the rights and the wrong. But there is an underpinning to all of the law. Love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon this rests all of the law and prophets. Not part of them, all. So you could get the statutes, the judgments correct. And completely blow God's intent. At that point in time, yeah, lest I come with a curse is a threat. God's just going to come down and do the nasty unless we get this other thing straightened out. That wasn't God's intent. When you understand the law was given by God on the foundation of love. He's letting them know. Turn your hearts towards your children. Children, turn your heart towards your parents. Biblically, children of God, turn your hearts towards your parents. This isn't the message that was given to the world. Malachi was given to Israel. When John the Baptist begins his ministry, he's not going out to the world. He's going to the Jews. Those who should know the law, but missed its foundation. And I just somehow double goofed. Oh boy. One second. Let's hear it for technical difficulties, and it's an IT guy in the pulpit. <laughs> Think about what the world would have been like if John hadn't succeeded in reaching the people that he did. Think about the generation we're in now. Before my kids got to be teenagers, I was teaching middle school and high school class. And I went to the parents. And I said, so, last time you talked to your son, last time you talked to your daughter, and before I could get any farther, I was always interrupted. Rich, we don't talk. What do you mean we don't talk? I can't talk with them. What? They don't listen to me anymore. And these were people in the church. What do you mean they don't listen to you anymore? They'll listen to their friends. Fact is, their friends will listen to me. Half the time when I'm driving them around to sports, their friends are always talking to me and listening. And my kids are in the back seat rolling my eyes every answer I get. We're called to that same challenge. To have our hearts turn towards our children so that their hearts can be turned toward us. But not because that's the end result that we're really striving for. We're striving to reach their hearts so that their hearts can reach out towards God. There's the other half, the other messenger, messenger of the covenant. Continuing on in Malachi 3, verses one, uh, 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit at a refiner. I'm sorry, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering 
and righteousness. If you look at that and don't think about what we've been discussing about love, what you hear is judgment. He's going to sit there and apply the heat with a propane torch and just torque it on up there. He is so much that the impurities rise to the top. Those impurities are deeply embedded. That's an uncomfortable kind of concept. I don't care if you're in a good condition. Having a blowtorch applied to you is not a pleasant experience. I know as a camp cook, I regularly was grasping a hold of hot metal trays when I was supposed to be using gloves. And somehow that just did not work with my brain because those kind of trays didn't come out of super hot ovens. You don't want heat applied. It's an uncomfortable experience. But what's the purpose? Is it just to agitate you? Is it just so that something gets taken out of you? Or is it to help you to grow the way you need to grow? To help you overcome the problems that are hurting your life, not only as you see it, but as your spouse may see it in you, as your children may see it in you, as your friends and other relatives may see it in you. God is talking here about bringing about a change that on the surface looks pretty intense. And yes, it is. I'm not denying that. But we recognize God's purpose in doing it, or we need to. Because if we don't recognize that purpose, we come across like a group of people standing on the side of the highway going, you're on the highway to hell, pointing at everybody else. Who wants to respond to a group that's fingers pointing that direction? Who's letting them know, oh, by the way, you all are messed up. Because that kind of accusation doesn't show love. And it doesn't show a right answer. There's no denying that the world's on the highway to hell without Jesus. But the answer doesn't need to be, you've blown it, and I'm good. That's judgment. That's almost a threat. It needs to be, the exit is here. The opportunity is now. You want a difference? If you're not happy with drugs, if you're not happy with the lifestyle you're living right now, <coughs> take your pick of unhappy. God can make a difference in your life. The why is the love of God. He came to be a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power and authority to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Salvation isn't a me thing. It's a God thing. It takes the power and the authority of God to save a soul. He loved us so much. He's willing to give us that power and that authority. That choice. He wasn't threatening. When John came, he wasn't threatening. He was warning the people to not overlook the love God was trying to show them. A love that they need to take in and reflect back so that their children would recognize their love towards them and be ready to show that same love back to God. 
I'm not going to throw up the next slide because that's just going to make it go longer. It's a foundation of love. On that foundation of love, we are given an opportunity. That opportunity isn't just in baptism. It's a full life opportunity. He isn't calling us for one change. He's calling us for a life change. Why? Because He loves us. That opportunity is yours, as I always say, not just now, but always. At this time, if you need to take on Christ in baptism, or if you need the prayers of the church, you may come as we stand and sing.